let the Lord shine forth. Hope everyone is doing well and everyone is still hanging there with the challenges I put together yesterday. And also those of you who live in England, I do hope and pray that you have not been melted and you are still <laughs> actively living as human being. And on the other side, uh, while I get sound check confirmations from the chat, you can see we've got Tony Costa with us. Peace of Christ be with you, brother. And peace of Christ be with you, Sister Hatun. Can I get can I get a permission to be recorded in this live stream? Absolutely, one hundred percent. Thank you. Um, how have you been, brother? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, beautiful day over here in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we have beautiful sunshine and. Uh, my wife and I have been working in the garden, trying to beautify our garden, and uh, the birds are singing. Uh, God's glory is all over the place. Good. Praise God for that. And it's not only we do praise God for his beautiful creation and his generosity, uh, the way he put the plants together, the way he put lots of different birds together. We do also remember today is uh, Ascension Day. Today yes. is the King of Kings uh, logic of cosmos, Lord of Lords, Lord Jesus Christ is taken up and seated on the throne. Uh, yes. Brother, would you like to just unpack that for us a little bit? Sure. Uh, Ascension Day, today is 40 days after Easter Sunday. Yeah. And so according to the gospel, 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus spoke to his disciples. He taught them. He prepared them for their great mission. And uh, on the 40th day, which always falls on a Thursday, uh, the Lord Jesus um, uh, finished his, uh, his instructions to the disciples. He gave them the final instructions in Acts 1-8 that they would be witnesses to him in all the world, starting in Jerusalem. And uh, they, as he ascended into heaven, it was a, he was, uh, this event was witnessed by two angels. And the two angels, the two young men in white apparel, were functioning as witnesses to what had occurred. And uh, their words to the disciples was, why do you keep looking up? This same Jesus who was taken from you today, he will come back in the same manner. He will return visibly, personally, uh, audibly. Uh, and so the problem, Hatun, is too many Christians are looking up all the time. They're looking at the skies and they're too busy wondering, when is he going to come? And they don't care about the world. And the word of the Lord to us is, you've got work to do. Uh, you've got to be his witnesses in the world. Another important aspect of Ascension Day is that Ascension Day is also the coronation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and of course, in, in, in the United Kingdom and Canada being a Commonwealth country, we, we all understand the concept of, uh, of uh, kings and queens and royalty. And of course, we understand that uh, the coronation is the ceremony where the monarch is installed and the monarch is, is sets on the throne, anointed with oil and so forth. And so of course, our Queen Elizabeth, uh, she was coronated in the, in the 50s after her father died. But the Lord Jesus Christ on Ascension Day, this is the time when the Father said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And so it is at this event called the Ascension that he went up on high. He went up, and that's what monarchs do. They go up to the throne and they sit on the throne and they're coronated. So our Lord went up, sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there, he intercedes for us as our great high priest. He is a priest king on the throne. He is a son of David who sits on the throne. He is prophet, priest, king. And uh, we await the day uh, when he will come again in like manner. And so uh, this is a blessed day. Uh, and we want to proclaim today that Jesus Christ is king of kings, Lord of lords, and that he sits at the right hand of majesty on high and that he is there uh, until the day when all his enemies are made his footstool. And when that <coughs> process is completed, then he will return. Amen. And as a Christian, we are longing for his return. But deep down, my prayer is that he will return a little bit later than sooner so that we have more opportunity and more time to preach Christ crucified. As well as right. um, those of you who sometimes feel far from God and that you feel you are not able to turn back to God or you are not able to pray. Remember, 
Lord Jesus Christ, who is seated on the throne, Son of the Father, is interceding for us. So have that confidence and remember there is nothing can change his love towards you. Within these notes, that was very uh, important notes, but I didn't want to kind of come up as like side note. <laughs> uh, today we are going to talk about um, something Muslims do quite a lot in our chat, um, which is copy and paste. Uh, and sometimes we get to witness uh, they copy and paste even without permissions. Um, and apparently, uh, according to Dr. Tony Costa, that Muhammad did s similar thing. He <laughs> um, copied other people's work. Is that correct interpretation? Absolutely. Even the Quran <laughs> admits that. Oh no, come on. That's just heartbreaking. Yes, the Quran does. In indirect fashion, a tongue in cheek fashion, the Quran also insinuates that Muhammad was known in his day to be a plagiarist, a copycat. He was known to be someone who was simply copying other stories and passing them off as something that Allah sent down and revealed in the Quran. Though there's plenty of evidence to show uh, that this is the case. And it is an embarrassing case. And Muslims end up doing the very thing the Quran tells them not to do. They say, well, yeah, of course it came from other sources, but there were divine sources. But that's not what the Quran says. Um, and, and so what we're going to see today is that the Quran is chock full of, uh, of examples where there are sources that they cite as coming from God, coming down, tanzil, the Arabic word tanzil, the verb means to send down, to reveal. Uh, it claims these stories are sent down. Remember, they're also preserved from all eternity in the heavenly tablet before Allah. So that means these stories were there long before uh, anybody on earth uh, knew about them. Um, that's a bit strange because now, in a sense, in a good, it's a good for us because especially um, the moderators who are in the chat, now you know where it comes from, where it comes the tradition of Muslim to copy and paste things. It all comes from Muhammad. So they are taking their prophet as their example. But I'm a bit uh, confused and I think it needs to be a little bit unpacking and some examples. Sure. Why would Muhammad yeah. copy and paste things without, yeah. I think, without yeah. permission? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. And as you know, uh, Hatun, uh, it, being myself um, an academic and working in, in university and, and seminary, um, plagiarism is a serious offense uh, in academia. Uh, it is so serious that you can be uh, expelled from the institution. It's, it's known as literary theft. You are stealing someone else's writings or even their idea. Even if I use your idea and pass it off as mine, that is also plagiarism. And so in, in, in academia, uh, a professor can be fired for plagiarism. I know, a prof I know a person in particular here in Toronto who had his PhD revoked, taken away from him, because it was shown that his doctoral dissertation was copied from another source or from various sources. Um, and so we need to understand that we and, you and I believe, Hatun, and all our brothers and sisters in Christ, we believe the commandment that says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You're not supposed to lie. And you're also not supposed to steal. Thou shall not steal is one of the God's Ten Commandments. And so stealing involves not just taking money or something that belongs to someone else, but it also involves taking someone's intellectual property. Uh, and so when I, if I take your intellectual property, that is illegal. Uh, and so that is something that I think our Muslim friends need to understand, is that plagiarism is a form of theft. Actually, um, it's interesting. Just It's coming to my mind now. I just finished a book which is talking about put together by Muslims how there are different Qurans. I'm just looking at the book. I'm just like, yeah, this is what I've been telling. Now they put it, that, put it together in a book. <laughs> There you go. You could, you could sue. You could nah. sue for copyright infringement. <laughs> nah, nah. So, um, Muhammad is dead. We can't sue him. Muhammad couldn't read and write. He never went to university uh, to be able to expel from the university. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can we look at some of the examples, and then from that we yeah. see how to handle someone who can't even read and write since we can't right. expel it, so what is the alternative we are going to offer 
the followers of Islam. Okay. Well, let me just, I just have a very short presentation that I will make here. Then we can talk about questions and so forth. Yeah. Let me just say that that there are there's some debate among scholars and not just Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, Quran, uh, 20, 7, sorry, Tony. Sorry, yeah. um, Tony. I lost you in a sentence when you said that uh, not all scholars. Just beginning of okay. your yeah. If you can, if you can take okay, that from the beginning. That. Sorry. Sure, sure. Let me just say that there are many scholars, including Western scholars. That is to say, uh, scholars who are not Muslims. They're they're academics in Islam and the Quran and the text of the Quran that would argue that Muhammad uh, was not illiterate, that in fact he could read and write. Uh, someone who is engaged in caravan trading, uh, exchanges and transactions, you would need to have some knowledge of, of writing and, 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 and reading. Uh, and we also know that he signed his name uh, yeah. at uh, one of the treaties. We also know that before he died, he did ask for writing material, and, um, and then he didn't write down what he wanted to write down. So... Some scholars would say, no, Muhammad actually was, was literate. Uh, Muslims base this on Surah 7, Ayah 157, that refers to him as the uh, prophet. It refers to him as al-Nabi al-Umi. Uh, um, al and uh, the word al-Umi, uh, they take as meaning illiterate, but it could also mean a, a Gentile, yeah. uh, a Gentile prophet who is not in the line of the Jewish prophets. Um, so there's a lot of debate on this. Now, I think one of the reasons why the Muslims say he was illiterate is that that way, they get to enhance the, the Quran. They they make the Quran this unique book. Well, how could he write it if he was illiterate? It's very similar to the Mormons when they claim that Joseph Smith was illiterate and yet Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon. But a lot of similarities there. So let me just let me just make this brief presentation. So as you know, uh, the Quran makes the claim that all of its contents, everything within the Quran, is heavenly in origin and that uh, it is not derived from earthly sources. The Quran says over and over again that it has been sent down. So, for example, Surah 2, verse 185, this Quran that's been sent down, this confirms its heavenly source. If it's sent down, it comes from heaven, obviously. Um, and this is further corroborated by the belief that the, the Quran is inimitable. That is, you cannot imitate the Quran, you cannot uh, imitate its surahs, you cannot even imitate any of its uh, ayat, that is, its uh, verses. And so the idea in Sunni Islam, at least, is that the Quran is an eternal book, it's the eternal speech of Allah, and that it is heavenly, that it was uh, preserved on the heavenly tablet, according to Surah 85, verse 21. Um, but here's the problem. The problem is that when people started listening to Muhammad, especially when he would recite these verses of the Quran, what happened was that many people started saying, now, wait a minute here. This sounds really familiar. I've heard that story before. Just like right now, Hatun, you said, hey, wait a minute. You just reminded me of something. Well, the people would listen to him and they would say, wait a minute. That story he just told us, my rabbi just said that in the synagogue last Shabbat. Uh, or a, a Christian would say, hey, I, I remember that story since I was a kid. My mom used to read that story to me at bedtime. And so the Quran says this, this is Surah 25, and it's interesting that it, this is called the criterion, uh, the Al-Furqan, the criterion. And so in Surah 25, verses 46, uh, excuse me, verses 4 to 6, verses 4 to 6, it says this, and I'm quoting from Ali's translation. But the misbelievers say, not is this but a lie, which he has forged, and others have helped him edit in truth. It is they who have put forward in iniquity and falsehood. And they say, tales of the ancients, which he has caused to be written. And they are dictated before him morning and evening. Notice verse 6. Say, the Arabic word cool. Say, the Quran was sent down. Anzalahu. It was sent down by him who knows the mystery that is in the heavens and the earth. Verily, he is oft forgiving most merciful. Now notice Surah 68, verse 15, that when our Quran, that when our revelations are recited unto him, he saith, that is the uh, the Kafir, Kafirun, mere fables of the men of old. These are just ancient stories, mere fables. 
In Surah 16, verses 103 and 105, Allah says, We know indeed that they say it is a man that teaches him. The tongue of him they wickedly point to is notably foreign, while this is Arabic, pure and clear. It is those who believe not in the signs of God that forge falsehood. It is they who lie. Now notice, Hatun, three times the Quran says, Surah 25, verses 4 to 6, Surah 68, verse 15, Surah 16, 103 and 105, three times the Quran makes reference to this charge that is being brought against Muhammad, that what he is saying is nothing new, that this is something that the people are familiar with, and the Quran responds by saying, not at all, not so. These things have been sent down from him who knows the mysteries. In other words, when Muslims are confronted with the argument that says, this story comes from this source, this story comes from that source, and they go ahead and say, yeah, yeah, it does come from those sources, but they're inspired. They are going against the Quran. They're agreeing with the critics. They're actually agreeing with the kafirun and agreeing that, yeah, these sources have been told by the ancients. In other words, the Quran forbids them from saying that these stories are earthly. In other words, these stories come from Allah. Now, the other interesting thing is that in Surah 16, verse 103, it talks about how the one that informs him, his, his language is foreign. Well, what does that have to do with the price of cheese in Japan? I mean, what's the point? Oh, he speaks in another language. So what? Somebody could translate on his behalf. And then the Quran says, this is Arabic, pure and clear. And we know, uh, Hatun, uh, that the Quran is not pure Arabic. It has a lot of loan words from Greek and Syriac. Even the word Quran is not Arabic in origin. It's Syriac. Um, even the word for the devil, Iblis, uh, it comes from the Greek Diabolos uh, and so forth. So let's look at a couple of examples and then we can take some questions. Um, in the Quran, Surah 5, verse 31, it talks about the story of Cain and Abel. And it says there, Then Allah sent a raven who scratched the ground to show him, that's Cain, how to hide the shame of his brother. Woe is me, said he, was I not even able to be as this raven and to hide the shame of my brother. Then he became full of regrets. Now, this is the story of Cain and Abel and Cain killing his brother Abel. And so he kills his brother and he doesn't know what to do with the body. And so a raven shows up and a raven starts to scratch the ground. And then Cain says, aha, I can just bury my brother in the ground. Well, this story, again, is not new. Uh, every Jew knew this story. It comes from the Targum of Jonathan ben Uzziah. And the Targums were Aramaic uh, paraphrases of the Bible. And uh, they arose around, they were written around the 200s AD, so 400 years before Muhammad. And in Targum of Jonathan ben Uzziah, lo and behold, we go there, and it says that Adam and Eve were sitting by the corpse of their son Abel, and they did not know what to do. They had not yet uh, known the knowledge of burial. A raven came up took the dead body of its fellow, in other words, uh, ravens were burying another raven, and having scratched at the earth, buried it thus before their eyes. Adam said, let us follow the example of the raven. So taken up Abel's body, they buried it at once. And so here we see an example where the Quran takes a story that was a very common story uh, among the Jews. Remember, Muhammad spent a lot of time in Medina where he uh, interacted with the Jews, and he would have heard these stories there in Medina. Well, what about this one? Uh, we hear our Muslim friends say things like this. The Quran says he who saves a single life, it's like he saved the whole world. Well, again, that's recorded in Surah 5, verse 32. It says in the Surah 5, verse 32, uh, on that account, we ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a, a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people and if everyone saved the life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. Well, when I first read this in the Quran, way back in the early 90s, I remember reading that and saying, wait a minute here. Um, this sounds a lot like the, the Mishnah. And lo and behold, Mishnah Sanhedrin uh, 4, uh, 5, it says there, we find it said in the case of Cain who murdered his brother, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth out. And he says, it does not say 
he hath blood in the singular, but blood's in the plural. Thou was created single in order to show that him who kills a single individual, it should be reckoned that he has slain the whole race. But to him who has preserved the life of a single individual, it is counted that he has preserved the whole race. Exactly the same words that we find in Surah 5 and verse 32. Well, what about the story of Ibrahim, of Abraham breaking the idols, being thrown in the fire by Nimrod in Surah 21, verses 51 to 71? This was a very well-known story uh, among the Jews as well. Uh, and it's found in the Midrash, Midrash Rabbah. Midrash Rabbah. It talks about Abraham breaking his father's idols. And then Nimrod comes along, and Nimrod throws Abraham into the fire. Uh, and, and that's because there's the play on words. If you know anything about rabbinic exegesis, uh, and my good friend Colin at uh, um, Islam Critiqued, which I would highly recommend, Colin has made a good point, a good argument, and provided good evidence that a lot of the rabbis used what is called esoteric interpretation. And, and what the rabbis would do is they would look at a word, like the word Ur, Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham come from. And the word Ur, if you look at it, looks like the Hebrew word light. And so the rabbis came up with this idea that Nimrod threw Abraham into the fire, into the light of the fire, to try to burn him. And the fire would not burn him. But here's the problem. If you look at the Bible, Nimrod is in Genesis 10 and 11. He's the one who's responsible to build the, the Tower of Babel. But in the Quran, it's, it's actually Haman. Haman is the one who is responsible for building the, the Tower of Babel. And Haman was a Persian, and he didn't exist till centuries later. But the Bible says it was Nimrod. And so what it does is it puts Nimrod in the same time as Abraham. And again, in the Quran, there's no sense of time. Everything is happening at the same time. There is no chronological order, right? So, you know, Miriam is the sister of uh, Jesus. The mother of Jesus, Miriam, is the sister of Aaron and Moses. So there's no sense of time. Well, what about the story of Solomon and Sheba uh, in Surah 27, verses 17 to 44? We have the story where uh, Sheba comes uh, to see Solomon, and, and she looks at the palace ground, and she thought it was it was water. She says, and she had to lift up her skirt, and, and because she thought she was walking on water. Well, this comes from the Targum of Esther. In the Targum of Esther, the rabbis talk about this story of the Queen of Sheba coming to visit Solomon in Jerusalem, and she was she she thought that the ground was water because it was such clear marble. Right. So what about the story about, for example, the, the, the Quran talks about in Surah 42, 17 and Surah 101, verse 69, it talks about the scales that are going to be used on the day of judgment. If your good works outdo your bad works, then you go to, into paradise. And if your bad works uh, outdo your good works, you go into Gehenna. Well, this story comes from the Testament of Abraham, uh, and it's part of a collection of books called the Pseudepigrapha, their second temple Jewish texts. And in that uh, Testament of Abraham, it talks about the angels coming forth with the scales and uh, the works of the, of the people are going to be placed on these scales. And if their good works outdo their bad works, then they will given, be given admission into heaven. So again, the same stories are being repeated. Um, one of my favorites uh, is, is Surah 7, verse 171, where Allah takes Mount Sinai and he raises it up over the heads of the Jews. Can you imagine a mountain over your head and Allah raises that mountain and he says, you better keep the law or I will crush you. Now, where does this come from? Uh, again, uh, this comes from the rabbinic writings in Avodah Sara. Avodah Sara, the rabbis talked about Allah or God in that case, Elohim, God grabbing Mount Sinai and raising it up and, and crushing the, the heads of the Jews. Um, and so what we find here is another story uh, that is very familiar to the Jews, but they're not in the Bible. Why does the Quran keep quoting from these stories, these fables, these rabbinic stories? They're not even found in the Torah. Well, here's another example. Uh, in Surah 7, verse 148, and Surah 20, verse 88, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, and they made a golden calf. Uh, the Quran says in Surah 7, verse 171, excuse me, 7, verse 148, that a golden calf jumped out of the fire and it lowed 
Now think about this. The golden calf jumps out of the fire and goes, moo. Think about that for a minute. You know, a, a cow comes out of the fire and starts to move. Well, again, uh, uh, my good friend Colin has, has done a very good uh, exegesis on this. He shows again that this goes back to the rabbinic esoteric interpretation of uh, Exodus 32. Not in the Torah, it's rabbinic exegesis. Muhammad didn't know the difference. He thought it came from the Torah. But you can look from, through the Torah, you'll never find the cow going moo, and you'll never find God taking up Mount Sinai, ripping it off the ground, and threatening the Jews with it. What about this one? Um, we hear uh, Muslims talk about that Allah is the Lord of the worlds. And Muhammad believed that, that there were seven worlds, seven heavens and seven worlds. Again, where does this come from? It comes from Jewish sources and Zoroastrian sources as well, the ancient religion of Persia. So in the Hagiga, which is a, a, a rabbinic text, the Hagiga speaks about seven heavens, seven earths. Why? Because seven is the number of perfection. Later on in the medieval period, in the Middle Ages, now this is post-Islam, you have the Zohar, which is connected to the Kabbalah, which is mysticism. And the Zohar also makes reference to the seven heavens and the seven earths. So this is a very entrenched Jewish idea. What about this one? Surah 2, verse 34. Surah 7, verses 11 to 18. When Allah creates Adam, Allah commands the angels to prostrate before Adam. Now, Muslims say, no, 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 no. They, they, what that means is they, they showed reverence. But the word used there is the word that means in Arabic to prostrate. It's the same word where we get the word masjid. A masjid, is the word for mosque, the masjid is the place of prostration. It's the place where Muslims go to to worship Allah in prostration. And the word used there is the same word used about the angels. They're to prostrate themselves before Adam. But Iblis, who was really, when you think about it, Iblis was actually a true monotheist. Iblis actually says, why should I bow before somebody who's made out of clay or made out of the dirt? I'm made out of fire. I'm made out of smoke. So there's a lot telling Iblis to prostrate before Adam. In other words, commit shirk by worshiping someone else other than Allah. And Iblis is actually being a better Muslim. He's actually saying, no, why should I bow down to him? He's, he's made of clay. Now, where does this come from? This also comes from a very famous source, pre-Islamic source, called The Life of Adam and Eve. It was also known among the Jews. Uh, if you read the book, The Legends of the Jews by Lewis Ginsberg, he mentions in there that this was a very ancient rabbinic story. And it also mentions, surprise, surprise, in these Jewish sources, had to, this sounds familiar, Adam was gigantic. It says that he had gigantic proportions. Adam was huge. And what do we read in the Hadith? He was 90 feet tall. We know where this comes from. It doesn't come, it's not something that we never heard about. These are stories that were already very much in circulation in ancient Arabia. Well, what about Christian sources? There, there's a number of Jewish sources that we looked at. Well, the story of the seven sleepers, Surah 18, <coughs> 8 to 250. The story of the seven sleepers. These guys uh, go into a cave and they sleep in there for over three centuries. My goodness, I mean, you know, I've slept in before, uh, but I've never slept in for <laughs> centuries. But they go in there and they sleep there for centuries, and then they come out, with, and they're alive, and it's a sign from Allah. Well, anybody, any Christian would know that this was a very famous work. It was written by a Christian by the name of Gregory of Tours. Uh, there's a, a Latin work uh, written by Gregory. And uh, it's known as the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus, a very famous story that was renowned by them. Here's another famous story that everyone was familiar with, Surah 18. It talks about this guy by the name of Zulkarnain. Well, who's Zulkarnain? Well, Zulkarnain means the two-horned one. And if you look at ancient images of Alexander the Great, we have coins, ancient coins from the Greco-Roman period. And it shows Alexander the Great, surprise, surprise, with two horns on his head. Now, why did Alexander have two horns on his head? To, to show that he ruled the eastern and western hemispheres of the world. 
he was the ruler of the world under his empire. And so the horns were symbols of power. And therefore, uh, the horns there in that, in that case represented Alexander's domain in the east and in the west. The Quran speaks of Zulkarnain, and it speaks of him as a Muslim as well, someone who was faithful to Allah. So what we find then in Surah 18 is a very well-known legend about Alexander the Great, which was very well-known. The Quran, Muhammad, takes this story and assumes that he is a Muslim, and Zulkarnain actually follows the sun and he finds that its resting place is in the muddy spring. Uh, it's interesting, Hatun. Just recently, I had a Muslim on Twitter telling me, "Nowhere does the Quran say that Muhammad, uh, excuse me, that uh, Zulkarnain followed the sun until it's set in the muddy spring." And I showed him the verse, and 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 I never heard back from him. And so the story of the story of of Alexander the Great uh, being a Muslim, even that is is so ridiculous. We know Alexander the Great was a polytheist. We know that he was a pagan. Uh, he was a, he was a sodomite. Uh, we know that he claimed to be the son of Amun Re, the sun god of Egypt, and so forth. He also claimed to be the son of Apollo, the Greek god Apollo. And so a lot of Muslims today will say, no, 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 Alexander the Great was not, that's not Zulkarnain. And yet Yusuf Ali says it was Zulkarnain, that Alexander was Zulkarnain. Uh, and the reason why they do that is because they simply change the narrative. When, when things go against the Quran, we simply change the narrative, we change it, and so forth. What about Mary? Uh, the mother of Jesus, we're told in the Quran, Surah 3, verses 35 to 37, that when Mary was a child, she was dedicated and raised in the temple, just like Samuel, when Hannah gave the prophet Samuel over. Uh, in the Quran, it says Mary was dedicated to the temple and raised there, and she was fed by angels. Well, we know that story. It's a very famous second century document called the Protevangelium of James. This is an apocryphal gospel that, that was supposedly written by James. And in that story, guess what happens? Mary is dedicated by her mother, Anna, to the temple. And, surprise, surprise, angels come and feed her in the temple. That's a very strange place for a woman to be in the temple, especially a little girl in the temple, because women were not allowed into the interior of the temple. They could only be in the court of the women. And, and so uh, whatever temple that is, that could not have been the Jewish temple. And we also know the story in Surah 349 and Surah 100, verse 110, where Jesus speaks from the cradle and uh, Mary points to him and he says, I am Jesus, I am the servant of Allah. Now we know where that comes from. It came from the infancy gospel of Thomas. And in the infancy gospel of Thomas, Jesus actually says, I am Jesus, the Son of God, who has been sent into the world. Muhammad took that, and he simply chained, got rid of the word Son of God, and introduced Jesus as saying, I am Jesus, the servant of Allah. Uh, the story of Jesus making clay birds. He's playing at the brook by the water, and he takes some, some mud, and he forms these little birds, and then he breathes on them, and they just go, they just fly off. You know, it's like, it's like a scene out of Snow White where the birds are flying around and so Jesus makes these little clay birds and he animates them again bedtime story infancy gospel of Thomas says exactly the same thing what about the birth story of Jesus in Surah 19 in Surah uh, Mariam uh, it's a very interesting birth story I call it Christmas in Hawaii because there you have Mary giving birth to Jesus under a palm tree and uh, she gives birth to Jesus under a palm tree and then there's water that issues out of the palm tree. And then the, the palm tree comes down and she grabs dates and she eats and so forth. There's, a, there's a, an apocryphal gospel called the Pseudo Gospel of Matthew. And it says the exact same thing. Mary went into a desolate place. She went under a palm tree uh, and she was in labor. And then uh, the child even talks to Mary. Uh, which is very unusual. Children usually don't talk to their mothers when they're born. They're usually too busy screaming and crying. But the baby says, oh, there's a, there's a tree, and the tree came down and gave her dates, and there's water that came out of the tree. All of these things are well-documented in the, in the pseudo-gospel of Matthew. 
Um, and then, of course, the story of paradise where you've got the Huris and the women. If you look at the Persian sources, the Persian sources are filled with these types of descriptions of women in paradise, uh, fulfilling your sexual desires and so forth. Even the word paradise, the word jana is not Arabic. It's Persian. Uh, and the word paradisos in Greek is not a Greek word. Paradisos is a Persian word. It's a Persian loan word. And so the very concept of Persian uh, of uh, the Persian word uh, jana being a garden filled with wine and rivers of milk and women and little kids with goblets and so forth, all of these things are vividly portrayed in these per these Persian sources. Um, and and as we 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 look at Surah 55, 56 to 58, and and Surah 56 verses 22 to 24, 25 to 37, the, the wide-eyed hoodies who have eyes like pearls and so forth, all of these things are very well attested in these ancient uh, Persian uh, sources uh, and Zoroastrian sources as well. So, Hatun, I think it's pretty obvious that the unbelievers were right. They were right that these are stories of the ancients, that we've heard these before, Muhammad, um, and why should we believe you? Which brings us back to that question we keep asking over and over and over again. What has Islam introduced that is new? Has it introduced anything new to the world? And the answer is no. So what has it introduced that we did not already know? There's one God. Jews have believed that. Christians have believed that. Uh, this God is the creator of the universe. Jews have believed that. Christians have believed that for centuries centuries, millennia. So I think it's very obvious and very clear that when we look at the sources of the Quran, they're not heavenly. They have not been sent down. They have come from earthly sources, and Muhammad took them as coming down from Allah. Thank you very much. Um, so we took approximately 30 minutes um, to just go through a list I put together here a list like just kind of uh, subtitled on the all the things you said and it's approximate a page without right. without any missing space I guess the, right. my basic question will come is um, and then I guess from this time if you have any questions or comments please put them in the chat and please put at sign in front of DCCI ministries we don't miss them so um, my basic question is, Quran is perfect Arabic and perfect word of Allah. And uh, Allah is all-knowing, all-wise, all-wisdom. Muhammad kind of just, he didn't have that much option or opportunity to say no to Allah. All he could do is just deliver the stories. If we have those stories, uh, which you claim that actually they are man-made stories, they are copied and paste without permission uh, why should we even have a problem at the first place because Quran states that Quran came to confirm the previous scripture and therefore we shouldn't be surprised if there is only one God and Allah and the God of Bible are the same then it is okay for us to think yeah Allah knew what happened in the past therefore Quran is the last book last revelation therefore it should be it's quite okay for those stories to be in the Quran mm -hmm. well one of the problems with that is that we know that these stories never happened in history so for example the story of Jesus speaking from the cradle or making clay birds uh, even even the most liberal scholars like Bart Ehrman would admit that those stories are fabrications they're not true they never happened. And the problem is the Quran speaks of them as if they really did happen. And so the issue here is that the Jews and the Christians never accepted these stories as scripture. So even the rabbis will admit that the story of the cow lowing when it came out of the fire or Allah picking up the mountain and he's going to crush it over the heads of, they admit that is not in the Torah. They admit that that is not scripture. And Christians understand that no, Jesus uh, didn't uh, make clay birds and, and breathe on them. And, and Jesus did not speak from the cradle when he was a baby and so forth. And so 
the problem here is that the Quran is quoting these stories as if they really happened. But how can you confirm the previous scriptures when those stories are not in the previous scriptures? In other words, the Quran does not know the difference between canonical scripture and apocryphal literature. And Muhammad, instead of quoting from the Gospels, which were current in his day, <laughs> called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is citing sources that are known to be apocryphal, but he doesn't know that. Muhammad doesn't know that they're apocryphal. He simply believes that they are true. And so what the Quran is doing is it's making the claim that it's confirming the previous scriptures, but the stories that it's alluding to, that it's pointing to, are stories that are not in the previous scriptures. Uh, and so when, when the critics respond by saying to Muhammad, listen, this is nothing new. We've heard this all before. Notice Muhammad doesn't say, of course you've heard it all before, because these are true things. These have happened, and Allah is confirming them. The response the Quran gives in Surah 25, 4 to 6 is, no, you do not say that they came from the ancients. You say they were sent down. In other words, what the Quran is responding to is it is refusing, it's rejecting the claim that these stories are earthly. They are all sent down from Allah. And so it's important to realize here that, again, Muhammad did not recognize, he didn't know the difference between a story, a fable, and what was true in Holy Scripture. So, um, I guess in that case, for me, it makes Allah is lack of, Allah is having lack of knowledge when it comes to history or when it yes. comes to basic previous scripture. For example, right. for example, Allah doesn't even know if the, oh, sorry, this is wrong book, sorry, that shouldn't be shown, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's, it's discipleship book. <laughs> anyway, Allah, Allah doesn't know, Allah doesn't know um, if the books Allah is, um, if the verses Allah is passing to Muhammad was really part of the previous scripture or not. So that's first problem right. with the history of Allah. Um, right. Lack of history, knowledge of Allah. And then second problem is when people accuse Muhammad that they heard the stories, they know about those stories, what happens is Allah steps in and then says, no, I right. am who is the author of those stories. Right. But what we see is, since those stories are not in the previous scripture, that's not only the issue, but main issue is we can see they are not historical. Correct. Uh, Correct. And Allah thinks he's getting away with that. Yeah, well, Allah is not, well, not very good at history, but he's also not good at theology because yeah. he thinks Christians worship three gods, and he thinks Christians worship Jesus and his mother Mary alongside of him. And so certainly if Allah knew all things, he would know that Christians never believe that. Yeah. Allah would know that the Council of Nicaea, which was 300 years before Muhammad, 325 AD, he would have known that Christians didn't believe in three gods. And so not only does he get history wrong, he gets theology wrong. Uh, and so what you begin to realize is that if in order for God to be God, one of the properties that God must have, what we call ontological properties, what God must have in his being, because God must be truthful. God must be the summit of truth. Uh, and unfortunately, in the Quran, you don't see that with Allah. Allah doesn't know what Christians believe. He doesn't know what Jews believe. He, he doesn't get history right. So you really got to step back and wonder, is this really Allah or is it Muhammad? And using Allah as a sock pu pu uh, puppet. Um, so I think it's very disconcerting. And, and the onus is on our Muslim friends to show us otherwise to show us why uh, they should believe these stories when they are clearly shown to be pre-Islamic and they come from sources that are not heavenly. Yeah, and also I'll just uh, point out previous video we did. Um, we had a video with um, recent answer and also we looked, we had um, Anthony Rogers with us a couple of months yeah. back. He talked about how it's not only Muhammad is taking stories from humans, but uh, humans are t sharing the story and correcting Muhammad and then there is also in one yes. step Aisha steps in and then Muhammad is already like second two step behind of everything and then after yes. that Allah re reached the rescue and then tries to rescue Muhammad from all that messed up and then reveals what 
first person already said. Uh, yes. Yeah, please. Even Omar, the Caliph Omar, said yeah. the same thing. He said, even some of my sayings got into the Quran. Yeah. Because tri- Muhammad liked them. Yeah. Uh, Three know, verses so of the Quran. So the Caliph Omar, and then, and then, of course, you have Ibn Sa'd. Ibn mm-hmm. Sa'd was one of the scribes that Muhammad used. And, and uh, he said, well, why don't we write it this way? And Muhammad says, yeah, that sounds good. Write it that way. And he thought, wait a minute. If you're a prophet of God and God is speaking to you, how can my words trump? Uh, God's words. Yeah. Uh, and so we have examples where Muhammad was was swayed by what Omar said or even uh, Ibn Sa'd. Yeah. Um, on Saturday, we are going to look at the uh, different Arabic Qurans, which is, has been confirmed by Muslims and then they put together a book together. You will, you will get to hear some interesting informations regarding how Muhammad mm-hmm. was already passing the stories, but that's for Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. So, uh, let me bring up a couple of comments and questions uh, mm-hmm. for so that we all kind of know what's happening. So first comment comes from a Muslim. Okay, this is like mm-hmm. copy paste Muslim. Yet mm-hmm. I don't think he's been uh, expelled from university yet. But <laughs> uh, question is um, why the Bible qu- quotations from the apocryphal sources? like Assumption of Moses in the 1st century, Jewish Apocryphal, uh, 2nd Timothy 3, 8, uh, Jude 9. Good question. Excellent question. Let me just say from the start that there's a difference between biblical inspiration and Quranic inspiration. Quranic inspiration is everything comes down. It's all sent down from heaven. In biblical inspiration, the Holy Spirit leads biblical writers to write what God wants them to write, and the, and the Bible doesn't come to us in one language. It's not pure Hebrew, pure Greek, pure Aramaic. The Bible comes to us in Hebrew, it comes to us in Aramaic, and it comes to us in Greek. And we know the biblical writers would use certain words of their day. Like, for example, the word for covenant is the Hebrew word brit. And so when Abraham, God told Abraham, I'm going to make a brit with you, I'm going to make a covenant with you. This was a word that was known in, 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 in the Canaanite culture. It was a Semitic word and so forth. That means uh, means an agreement and so forth. God sovereignly used the biblical writers, sovereignly used the language of the day, the culture of the day to bring about his revelations. So the first thing is we got to be careful about the fallacy of equivocation. Muslim interpretation is not the same as Jewish Christian interpretation. Our views of inspiration are not exactly the same. Now, to get to our, our, our friend's question, um, he says, well, the Bible quotes uh, apocryphal sources. Right. But does it quote it as scripture? And the answer is no. So, for example, uh, he quoted from Jude. So in Jude 9, and I think he forgot Jude 14, uh, in, in Jude 9 and in Jude 14, Jude talks about this dispute that the devil uh, had uh, with the archangel Michael about the body of Moses. And this was a, a, a story that the, our, our friend is absolutely right. It is believed to have come from a document called the Assumption of Moses. And if you look at what Jude says, Jude never says that scripture. He never uses the technical formula as it is written or as the scripture says. This was a story that was true, accepted by the Jews. And uh, Jude is demonstrating that that story coincides with what God has already revealed. He doesn't quote it as scripture. If you look at Jude 14, he quotes from the first book of Enoch, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, and he quotes this passage where it says, the Lord comes with myriads and myriads of his saints. But if you look at that, Jude does not call that scripture. This is important. Jude acknowledges this saying, but he says it's true, but he doesn't call it scripture. He also quoted from the book of Letter of Timothy, where uh, Paul talks about, uh, verse chapter 3, verse 8, he talks about Janes and Jambers, who were the magicians that opposed Moses and so forth. And if you look at that, notice again, Paul never says, as it is written in the scriptures. He doesn't quote that as scripture. In Acts 17, here's another one. Acts 17, when Paul is preaching at Mars Hill, or the Areopagus. He quotes from Greek philosophers, and he says, as your poets have said, in him we move, we live, we have our being, we are his offspring, and so forth and so on. Did Paul claim that these Greek philosophers were inspired prophets? Absolutely not. 
Paul quotes them because what they say is in agreement with Scripture, with what God has already revealed. And so you see, the biblical writers are free to quote these other sources, but what they don't do is they don't call them Scripture. The Quran, on the other hand, claims that these other stories are Scripture because they're sent down by Allah and they've been preserved in the heavenly tablet in Allah's presence. So notice we're talking cats and dogs here, two different categories. The Bible never calls those sources scripture, but the Quran does, and that's the difference. And so biblical writers can quote other sources. You know, Paul quotes in, in, in Titus, he talks about uh, the Cretans, their philosophers say all Cretans are liars. He's quoting a philosopher. Does that mean that the philosopher is inspired? No. He is saying that what he says is in agreement with what God has revealed. So we're talking cats and dogs, apples and oranges, two different categories. Um, just uh, let me add something on that. If you remember, uh, dear Muslims, that you've been teaching around, your scholars are teaching around, that Quran is all the word of Allah. Okay, right. Mo Muhammad is just a delivery box for the for the Quran. If you think about a computer, you put the information, and then you, it comes out from the printer, and you need to print out. So that's what, according to Islam, according to Muslims, that's what Muhammad does. Uh, if you, or if you think about kind of in the Christian um, point, Christian theology, Mary, mother of Jesus, is the one who who delivers. The word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what Muhammad does. Muhammad, all he does is delivers the word of uh, word of Allah. He doesn't add anything, and those are the sayings of Allah. And it seems, uh, when we look at the evidence and when we compare all the writings, it seems that Allah put the informations for Muhammad to pass it from generation to generation. He didn't have any. Muhammad didn't have any sayings on this. He passed on to generation to generations with knowing those are the stories people are already aware of it. That is the problem. Mm -hmm. That is the problem. It gets, it gets worse, right, Hatun? In Surah 1, Allah is talking to himself. Allah's praying to himself. to himself. Praising to himself and praising himself as well. Uh, so it gets really problematic. And, of course, Surah 113, 114, you've got these... these uh, these statements that are like amulets against evil and so forth. That's why Ibn Masood said you shouldn't have Surah 1, Surah 113, 114. He only had 111 surahs. Yeah. Uh, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, yeah. But you're absolutely right. The Muslim is trapped because the Quran, they say, is Allah speaking to, uh, to us. It's Allah's direct speech. And so they can't get themselves out of that trap. Uh, in the Bible, you've got the words of wicked men, you got even quotes from the devil and so forth. But it's a preserved, inspired account of what these people did. So Jesus versus Quran, Mary versus Muhammad. When you kind of theologically try to compare things, that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, um, we did kind of uh, address this, but um, question come in a little bit different version. Uh, Muslims may argue that those stories might be true. Uh, might be true, they just shorten those historical facts for our Bible. How do we address this? Yeah, well, the problem is we, we know where they came from. Uh, we know, for example, uh, one Muslim fellow was telling me on Twitter that the story of God raising Mount Sinai over the, the heads of the Jews and the, the, the cow mooing out of the fire, he says, that was in the original Torah. Uh, and I said, the Jews corrupted it. Well, why would the Jews get rid of those stories if they were in the Torah? That's the first problem. The other problem is that we know what the Torah looked like in the days of Muhammad. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls that date to up to 250 BC, and the Torah that has been preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it looks exactly like our Torah. There's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, and we don't find any stories of a cow jumping out of the fire and going move. We don't find Allah raising up Mount Sinai over the heads of the Jews. So we know what the what the Torah looked like in the days of Muhammad. And Muhammad himself, if you remember the story in Sunun uh, Abu Dawud, you will remember that Muhammad took the Torah and, you know, he was sitting on a cushion, gets off the cushion, takes the Torah, puts it on the cushion and says, I, he talks to the Torah. So now he's talking to the scriptures. He says, I believe in you 
and the one who sent you down, who revealed you. Um, and so the issue here is that we know what the Torah looked like in the days of Muhammad. And we know where these stories come from. They come from rabbinic writings. Uh, and so the onus, again, is on our Muslim friends. So their approach is what we call, we call this an ad hoc approach. The Latin word ad hoc, A-D-H-O-C. Ad hoc means it's a contrived argument. They are making an argument without evidence that's contrived right from the beginning. And so they know that there's no way out. So they have to say, well, maybe these stories did exist before. Where? Where's the evidence? Where's the proof? We don't see it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We, we, we don't see it in, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So once again, bring forth, as the Quran says, bring forth your evidence, bring forth your truth, bring forth your argument. And so there is no argument here. And to say that there is something that you have no proof for is wishful thinking. So while Muhammad does copy and paste, uh, do we have any, um, any kind of uh, Muslim authors in the academic circle are simply addressing this in a sense, yes, Allah made a mistake because I am very in academic circle. Lots of Muslims are not really Muslims. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. But those who are really academic, uh, a lot of them are, you're right, Hatun, they're nominal. They're nominal. Uh, and, and a lot of Muslims say, oh, they're just liberals and so forth. But it's okay to quote liberals against the Bible, but yeah. you can't quote liberals against the Quran. So there's a double standard there. So we'll quote Bart Ehrman, we'll quote all these other scholars against the Bible, but you can't quote those guys. Well, why? Well, because they're not really Muslim. Uh, again, double standards. Um, but there are scholars who are, who are Muslims and practice Islam and who are honest. So, for example, I remember at, uh, when I studied at the University of Toronto, we had, um, we had Professor uh, Mahmoud Ayoub uh, was a professor there in, uh, in the Middle Eastern Islamic uh, Department. And I remember Dr. Ayub uh, actually came out and he honestly said he was he was struggling with Surah 9, verse 30, where it says the Jews say Uzair, Ezra, is uh, is Ibn Allah, that he is the son of God, the son of Allah. And the Christians say that al masih the Messiah, is the son of God. And Dr. Ayub was honest enough to admit that no Jew has ever said that. There are no Jewish documents that ever say that Ezra is the son of God, as Christians say Jesus is the son of God. And I was really uh, impressed with his honesty that he was willing to say there is no evidence for this claim. And so what he suggested was some, some Jew would probably would have, would have, you know, they played around with Muhammad, they joked, or they, they poked fun at him. I could see a Jew at Medina saying, yeah, you know, we believe Ezra is the son of God, just like those Crazy Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and Muhammad took it as a truth statement. So that's one possibility, that Muhammad simply took the word of some, of some prankster, some Jewish guy that was playing a prank on him, and took it as, as, as gospel truth. So um, there are scholars uh, uh, who are coming out. There is one, actually, in Germany. Uh, there was one Muslim scholar uh, who was a convert to Islam, a German convert to Islam, and um, he actually... Uh, began to investigate the, the 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 source materials for the existence of Muhammad, because he said that it wasn't fair that academia was trying to argue whether or not Jesus existed. Well, he used the same principles, and I can send you the article on this, uh, Hatun. If your listeners want a copy of the article, I will send it to them. Uh, anyway, he came out and he said when he studied all the Ibn Ishaq and and and. He looked at all the historical sources for Muhammad. You know what he concluded, Hatun? You won't believe this. He concluded that based on the evidence, he says, in all likelihood, Muhammad probably never existed. I'll send you the article. Uh, and you know what happened after that? Uh, they, they threatened his life. The, they said he was an apostate, he was a murtad, and he should be put to death. And, and then he was, he actually was, actually, he did leave Islam after. He says, I, I can't stay in a religion that treats people like this. But uh, he was willing to be honest with the evidence, and uh, and his conclusion was that uh, that Muhammad probably never existed. Yeah. So when the academic looks at it, some of them says yes, there is a problem. Oh, uh, for sure, for yeah. sure. So um, another question is: This is about the Islamic Mary. 
and the one who was like 1,400 1, years old when she gave birth to Jesus as a virgin. That's uh, wow. Quran called Virgin Mary the sister sister of Aaron and the daughter of daughter of Imran. But Imran right. was the father of Maryam, Moses and Aaron. How right. did uh, out of the Quran make such a mistake? Well, he didn't know the difference. Uh, he, he heard the word Miriam, and he heard that Miriam was also the sister of Moses and Aaron, and, and he simply assumed that it was the same Mary. Now, in, in, the, in the Hadith, uh, someone comes to Muhammad and says, well, why, why, why do they... See, Muslims were aware of this, so, it, so in the time of the Hadith composition, they began to en engage with Christians, and Christians would, would make fun of them and say, where do you get the idea that Mary is the sister of, of Aaron and Moses? Uh, and if you read the works of John of Damascus, he was a, an early church father, uh, a Syriac uh, church father. John of Damascus brings this up as well. And when they asked Muhammad about this, they said, well, the, the reason why they called her the sister of Aaron was the Jews had a custom that uh, they, would, uh, they would name their children after great uh, figures of their religious history. And so because Aaron was uh, the first high priest, uh, Mary was was called his sister, but there's a problem with that. The Jews did not associate people. Uh, for example, Jesus was not the brother of David. Jesus is the son of David. The Jews tr traced people by by descent, by being the son of so and so or a daughter of so and so. They never referred to people as being Jesus. For the Messiah is not the brother of David. The Messiah is the son of David. So Muhammad basically said, well, they called her the sister of Aaron because that's how the Jews did it. No, that's not how the Jews did it. The Quran is very clear. She is the sister of Aaron, Harun, and she's also the daughter of Imran. And Imran is actually the Arabic word for the Hebrew Amram, who was the father of Moses and Aaron in the book of Exodus. And so, again, uh, there is no way out of this. They're in a trap. They're in a textual trap, and they just can't get out of it. And Muhammad's explanation is really silly because it doesn't prove anything. Uh, yeah, so in one way you can say, yeah, auto of the Quran doesn't doesn't know basic basics, or on the other yeah. hand, or or you can pick the other side and then say, yeah, uh, it is the miracle of Islam. Mary was one thousand four hundred years old virgin when she gave birth to Jesus, and she lived while Jesus was living and uh, yeah. walking around. And I, I know some I know some older Marys than that. I mean, there's a Mary I know that is, well, she's, she's alive today, and so she is over 2,000 years old and gave birth to a son. So because she's called Mary, is she the mother of <laughs> Jesus or the, the sister of her? No, 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 no. Of course, that's silly. Um, uh, I will rephrase this question a little bit differently. So, when uh, when we say Quran is the direct word of Allah, um, how can that be? Because uh, according to Islamic tradition, Allah gives message to uh, Gabriel, and then Gabriel passes it to Muhammad. So there is a bridge. There is a, uh, a there is a heavenly being kind of traveling between Allah and Muhammad. Right. Why do we still say Quran is the direct word of uh, direct speech of Allah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, what Muslims would say is that Gabriel functioned as a conduit. He was an interest. He was a mediator in a sense. He's the one that simply delivered the words of Allah to, to Muhammad. Let's not forget there's another one. There's Iblis. There's the devil as well. Because you remember the devil also put words into, uh, into Muhammad's mouth and uh, the satanic verses of Surah 53. Muhammad didn't know the difference between the voice of Iblis and the voice of Gabriel, which is very, very disconcerting. So that's what Muslims would say, is that, Ab that Gabriel acted as that intercessor because Allah is so transcendent, so removed, he needed to use someone else. And you see, this is the difference, isn't it, Hatun? This is the difference between the God of the Bible and the God of Islam. The God of the Bible spoke face to face with Moses, and he spoke directly to Moses. Moses heard the voice of God when he spoke to him. And therefore, that prophet that is to come, and we covered this in a previous segment, if Deuteronomy 18.15, that prophet would be like Moses, a prophet who knew God face to face and to whom God spoke directly. The other prophet that we know of, the prophet who was like Moses, was the Lord Jesus Christ, who God spoke directly to. He is the eternal Son of God who was face to face with God and who is himself God by nature. And so 
the Muslims have a big problem here because um, it claims to be the direct speech of Allah, but it's not directly given from Allah directly to Muhammad. It's given through an intermediary uh, that is Gabriel. And so um, the God of the Bible reveals himself either directly, which he did to Moses and to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, or he uses prophets. He uses angels as well to, to pass his word, like Gabriel when he came to Mary and so forth. But the problem with the Quran is that it claims to be the direct speech of Allah. But the questioner is absolutely right. It was the direct speech of Allah, but it was through an intermediary. And the problem with that is the satanic verses. Uh, uh, Muhammad could not tell the difference between the voice of Jibreel and the voice of Iblis. Yeah, that's such a shame for men of God. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you the last question to you. Um, so we looked at the, you gave me like over a page, over a page mm -hmm. um, of how uh, stories of the Quran has been copied and pasted without permission uh, mm -hmm. from non-biblical sources and even non-historical sources. And also you kind of uh, mentioned a little bit um, while is the Quran perfect word of um, Allah in Arabic, you also uh, give like a couple of side examples that some words in the Quran are actually not Arabic. Mm. Uh, can, mm. can you unpack that little bit for us? A couple of yeah, people I are... Mean, yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, a, a very good work in this area. It's still, it's a class, it's, it's dated, but it's still very good. It's by Arthur Jeffrey, Arthur Jeffrey. And he wrote a book called The Foreign Vocabulary of the Quran. It's a mm. very good book. Uh, and in that book, Dr. Jeffrey, uh, who was professor at Columbia University in New York, Professor Jeffrey uh, shows that many of the words used in the Quran are not pure Arabic. Uh, there are Persian loan words. There are uh, Syriac loan words. The very word Quran is not Arabic. It's, it's based in, in, in Syriac, and it has the idea of, of, of speech and writing and so forth. Um, and... Words like uh, Iblis. Uh, why is the devil called Iblis? Now, shaitan in Arabic comes from the Hebrew. Hebrew, shaitan, means the adversary. Um, but the word Iblis is not uh, Arabic. Iblis is a derivation of the Greek word diabolos, which is the Greek word for the devil. Look at Constantinople. Constantinople uh, was the center of the Eastern Church, but when the Muslim Turks came in and invaded 1453, what did they rename it? Istanbul. Istanbul. What is Istanbul? It's a short form for Constantinople. Um, and so there are many examples uh, of these loan words that we find in the Quran. And so to claim that it is pure Arabic, as we saw in uh, Surah 16, where it says in verse 103, this is pure Arabic, pure and clear. Uh, is it, that is false? It's been it's been openly admitted by any serious scholar, Muslim or non-Muslim, that the Quran is filled with foreign words. No doubt about it. Yeah, and um, we've got list. We can um, send them to you. Uh, yeah. Just a kind of gentle correction. Take this as gentle as you can. Sure. Ottomans didn't uh, invade. Um, Turkey, uh, we shared life. We go to the different countries. We don't invade. I'm from Turkey, so we share. We simply share life with people who live there. <laughs> <laughs> because word word invade is kind of cause lots of dead people under it stuff. Yes, those things happen, but yeah. in, in Turkish history, we we kind of learn as we shared life. So we went to conquer Serbia. We shared life with them. We took Istanbul 1914-53 because we wanted to share life. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was pointing to 1453. Yeah, so that was in the intention of sharing life and also sharing yes. the culture, sharing of the course. language. <laughs> of course. And taking yeah. the people's life, of course. Actually, yeah. I've got, I'm going to go through the, the 35 years or 30, 30 years of genocide. Um before lockdown finishes, it's talking about how Ottomans uh, did yes. sharing life. 
Um, okay. Yes, yes. And Sorry. that's all sarcasm, and that's a good sarcasm. <laughs> no, that's what, like actually, that. that's what we, we used to learn in history lessons, that it's yes, the purpose yes. of sharing life. Um, right, right. Okay, this is last question. For sure, this is last question. Um, I can see questions are coming, but um, can you speak a little bit about the satanic verses? Because in somehow... Uh, Muslims don't want to talk about it, and um, it's good for us to understand it better. So that will be the background of Surah 53, verse 19 to 21. Yes, yeah. yes. The, the story of the Satanic Verses is, is a story that basically says that uh, when Muhammad was trying to appease uh, the, the Meccans, the, the Arabs, the Quraysh, uh, who are the Arabs of his tribe, uh, he was trying to woo them, win them over to Islam. Uh, and uh, at one point... Um, he comes up with these verses where he says, "Have you considered Alut? Um, uh, uh, sorry, Alat Al Uzza and Manat. Uh, have you considered them, the exalted cranes?" Um, and and he bows down with the Quraysh and he worships with them, and he mentions these these three goddesses, which the Arabs believe were daughters of Allah, uh, and Alat. Uh, of course, we have a feminine form of the word Allah there. And uh, the and Manat was associated with fortune and, and so forth, and so he mentions these these three goddesses and he calls them exalted cranes because they're like intercessors. They can fly up to the heavens and they can intercede for them with Allah. Well, uh, when the other Muslims heard this, they were really upset with Muhammad and they said, "How did you? Why did you do this? You honored their gods and you worshipped." And then it was later revealed to him by Gabriel that uh, why did you say those words? Those were not my words. And then he was told that the devil, Iblis, threw those words into his mouth. And that's why they've been called the Satanic Verses. Um, so all, this story is authentic. A lot of Muslims have tried to say, no, 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 this never happened. This is a later tradition. Why any, no Muslim would have made up this story. There's something called the criterion of embarrassment, which basically says that if a story is really, really embarrassing, the likelihood is that it is true, that it actually happened. Um, and so it, it's, it, is, it is mentioned by Ibn Ashaq. It's mentioned in multiple sources. Um, there was a, a scholar Tabari. at the University of Michigan. Yes, and Tabari. There was a scholar at the University of Michigan who actually did a whole dissertation uh, on this. Uh, and he argues from multiple, multiple Islamic sources that this event happened. It is a true event in the life of Muhammad. And of course, uh, if you remember... Uh, the book that was written, uh, The Satanic Verses, uh, by a, an Englishman, uh, if you remember, Salman Rushdie, yeah. uh, he was threatened by the Ayatollah Khomeini, and he's still uh, under threat uh, from, from writing that book. Um, and so The Satanic Verses is an embarrassing moment in the life of Muhammad, but what it does is it shows us that Muhammad was not able to discern the difference between the voice of Allah and the voice of the devil. So here's my question to our Muslim friends. If if Satan deceived Satan, uh, excuse me, if Satan deceived Muhammad in Surah 53, how do we know he hasn't deceived him in other parts of the Quran? That's the question. And so a prophet that doesn't know the difference between God's voice, uh, and the Quran goes on to say, oh, this happened to other prophets. Really? Show us. Where did this ever happen to Jesus or Moses? or Isaiah, or Elijah, or Peter, or Paul, or John. Show us one place in the Bible where a prophet didn't know whether it was God or the devil talking to him. There is no such account. Uh, and so this is a very embarrassing story in the life of Muhammad, but it's a very serious one when you really consider the ramifications. Uh, also, just in um, addition to Surah 53, we do have Islamic sources uh, which identify Surah 1 is actually... Revelation is coming from the Satan. Uh, mm -hmm. A man is in the Satan form comes and then gives the Surah Fatiha, Surah One of the Quran. Um, just mm -hmm. also, just another side information for uh, those of you who are watching us regularly. Uh, just a small plugging out something. Last week we talked about power of Umar over heavenly beings. We talked about how much power Umar just as a man head where he was able to uh, help Allah out to put certain verses in the Quran. So three verses end up in the Quran because Allah was inspired by Umar. 
And then we looked at the stories where uh, heavenly beings are freaking out from Umar and they are changing their directions and Satan can't even get close to Umar. Yet, Muhammad doesn't even know the voice of Satan. Also, now what uh, Tony said is, if Umar wasn't there to confront Muhammad, Muhammad was still quite okay to continue to worship the pagan gods. Umar is very, very powerful figure in Islam. Just wanted to bring that to people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, yeah, if I could just add, if I could just add something. Yeah. In the end, what do Muslims keep telling us? Uh, Muhammad brought pure monotheism. Uh, he yeah. brought Tawhid. And Islam is about pure monotheism. And when you look at it, uh, actually, no, it's not. It's not. It's, as you rightly said, that if it was not for Umar, uh, Muhammad would have been quite fine with, yeah. with what he did, uh, with, yeah. uh, with the worship of the goddesses. Yeah. And um, I did so, actually, Phil put the uh, link in the chat as well. But uh, there is actually theological issues as well with the satanic verses, because we, what we see is, on the Day of Judgment, uh, Quran is going to turn up in the um, shapes of flocks and going to intercede. Surahs are going to intercede for those who have the right recitation. So even though in somehow Surah 53 didn't end up, Surah 53, 19 didn't end up in the Quran as it was, yet we see it end up in all of Islamic theology regarding the power and identity and the deity of Quran as a book. Right. And remember, too, uh, Allah, Taluz, and Manat are yeah. in the preserved tablet. Yes. They're eternally <laughs> existed with Allah. Yeah. So their names were already on the preserved tablet before it was sent down, which is, which is very interesting as well. So it's not just the Quran. I mean, everything starts talking. I mean, even the, the rock, uh, the stone, the black stone of the Kaaba is going to have a mouth and eyes, and it's going to talk on the Day of Judgment. So yeah. talk about paganism. Who who are the people who believe that these things can happen? Well, pagans believe that idols and, and rocks can, can be animated and speak and so forth. So imagine that on the Day of Judgment, a rock is going to speak and say, yep, this guy came and he gave me a big hug. He smooched me, kissed me, caressed me, and so forth. Think about that for a minute. I mean, this is the stuff that cartoons, children's cartoons are made of. But Muslims have to believe this. They have no choice because it's in the in Islam's most uh, most trusted sources. Yeah. And you can't deny Muhammad. If you deny Muhammad, you become apostate. But right. even though if you become an apostate, uh, there is always better one. There is always perfect one whom you can turn back. That's Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, teachings of Muhammad is like out of control. Uh, the teachings of Allah in the Quran is out of control. Muhammad copied and pasted unreliable sources into the Quran. But there is only one perfect word of God, identified as Lord Jesus Christ. And in the beginning of the live stream we talked about, today we are celebrating that after the death and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ, after 40 days, he went and sat on the throne right hand of the Father. That is the perfect eternal word of God. It's not corrupted. There are no different... Um, stealing or copying and pasting other things is perfect and perfectly satisfied. That's the word of God. Yes, and he's a perfect savior yeah. and he can perfectly save you because his work is perfect. He has finished his work. That's why he sat down because the work is finished. It was accepted by God the Father as a perfect sacrifice. And so Jesus is not standing around. He sits down because his work is finished and he's interceding for us, and um, the time is still here. He, he is sitting there until his enemies are made his footstool, and so the day of grace is still here. The day of salvation is still open to you. So today, the Bible says, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, but turn to him. God's grace is available today. It won't be here forever. The day will come when it will end, but we, we, we pray that our Muslim friends who are tuning in, we want you to know that we care about you. We love you. And we want more than anything for you to know the love and, and, and the peace that Hatun and I have with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, Jesus Christ uh, is, is the only hope that you have. He's the only true Savior of sinners. And so the Bible says that if you, 
confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it's a free gift. Uh, you don't have to pay for it. Uh, you don't have to do something for him to love you. He loves us with an everlasting love. And so Jesus invites you today. He says, come to me, all of you who are tired and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me and learn of me. I am humble and meek. Take my yoke upon you for it is light and easy. And so come to him. The Prince of Life, the Prince of Peace opens his arms to you. Come to him and have eternal life. Amen. And of course, that just reminds us uh, Ravi Zacharias is with uh, our risen Lord now. And it is, yes. it is a huge privilege. He's been serving him faithfully for decades. Now, Lord Jesus Christ welcomes him to his place where he can yeah. have perfect, satisfied fellowship with That's him. That's right. Uh, yep, finish the race. Yeah, a good, faithful um, servant. Uh, servant. If you do not have Lord Jesus Christ, of course, then probably as in this virus you are just freaked out what's going to happen to you when you die. All we can say is, while you are taking your breath, please, 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 come and worship the Son of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Uh, Thank you very much, brother, for joining us and bringing My pleasure. Uh, bringing all uh, kind of perfectness of Islam to our attention and making us to think through. Uh, and thank you very much, those of uh, you who uh, joined us in chat. Uh, we will see you tomorrow. Uh, remember, um, for pictures of Mohammed, uh, do send me email uh, at info. Uh, email info at dccministries.com and then we can handle them and then we can go through them tomorrow. In that time we will also be looking at the life after death for Muslims and for Christians. Um, God bless you all. We we'll see you again. Thank you very much brother.